to have to be messing with any hosts or anything like that or any Zoom chats or any, you know, technical difficulties because we're going to be back together in person. But uh, guys, what an awesome service this morning. And, uh, you know, I just really thought it was so special. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys caught this, but Desiree's communion really was on being at peace despite the situations. Why? Because of surrender. And then Andre talked about the widow being surrendered in her finances, giving to God. And so I love how the Holy Spirit just works right there, that the unity. And it's interesting today because I'm going to be talking about what we need to have surrendered, which is our heart. And so I thought it's just cool how it just, you know, works like that. And I'm going to be talking about the heart. But uh, Des, thank you so much for your awesome communion uh, and really just being very vulnerable with us. Uh, um, being open and, and uh, to see your example, though, and the surrender that you've had to go through these challenges, go through these hardships, and yet persevere and stay faithful because of your surrender. And then Andre as well, you know, just teaching us. I, I, I don't know why, but I've never caught that before that she was a widow. So usually the, the husband would provide and that she had to provide for her own. And yet was that surrendered that she gave everything. And I think that just shows the heart that we need to have. And of course, it was so awesome, Dylan and Jasmine with the welcome right there, and then Lance with the reverent prayer. You know, we got to get some reverent prayers going on, so thank you, Lance. And then, of course, Joseph and Magnolia placing membership in the region. So, so, so excited for that. And uh, guys, go ahead and turn in your scriptures to Mark chapter 4. Turn to Mark chapter 4. Come on. And, uh, you know, today we're going to start our Mark series. It's going to be a four-week series. And uh, we, we studied out Haggai, Zechariah, Nehemiah. Then last week we took a little break to really get going after a September to remember. But today we're going to start our Mark series. And we got to get a little bit of background about the book of Mark. So the Gospel of Mark is one of the three synoptic Gospels, those being Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, of course, it's written by John Mark. And this is the same John Mark in Acts 13, who is with Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. And of course, just a couple verses later in the same chapter, he deserts them and goes back to Jerusalem. And many think, you know, he just gave up on the mission field. But actually, more, more likely than not, he didn't feel good or comfortable sharing with the Gentiles because that's where they were going to. And so he went back to Jerusalem. But later, Paul says, hey, during the end of his life, bring John Mark because he's helpful to my ministry. So that's who, that's who wrote the book of Mark. And he writes it in about the 50s AD, and it's the shortest of the Gospels. The book of Matthew has 28 chapters. Luke has 24. John has 21. Mark has 16 action-packed short chapters right there. I mean, you can read Mark in one sitting, and it's just got some. You want to read something good for your quiet time, go to the book of Mark right there. And so we're going to be going through this book the next couple of weeks, but today we're going to be in Mark chapter four, in Mark chapter four. And we need to fired from chapter one to three to get to Mark chapter four. So at this point in Mark four, Jesus has called these guys. He started healing many people, casting out demons, healing the lame, etc. He's appointed his 12 apostles. And he's ruffled up the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. He's gotten some persecution right there, even from his family, as in chapter three, he says, hey, you guys even aren't even my family. Anybody who does the will of God is my family right there. And so we're going to be taking a look in chapter four. All this has happened. And now we're going to study out one of the parables that Jesus teaches in Mark chapter four, verse one. Mark chapter four, verse one. And right here it says, again, Jesus began to teach them by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables and in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow a seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. 
Then Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus is out here. And there's so many people that come crowding around Jesus because they say, hey, this guy can heal us, that he gets out into a boat and he starts to teach. And he starts off with this parable. And he says, hey, there are now four types of different soils, right? And he says, the first one is the path. And the path is so hard that the seed goes onto the path, but it cannot penetrate it. So the birds come and take up that seed and take it away. Then you've got the rocky soil, which the seed springs up quickly, but there's no root, so it dies quickly as well. Then you've got the thorny ground. The seed grows up a little, but it's choked out by the thorns around it. And then lastly is the good soil, where the seed grows and it produces the crop and it just multiplies in an incredible way. And it's funny because the disciples, they come back and they're like, hey, what does this mean? He's like, what? Don't you guys know what this means? Oh my gosh. Okay, let me just explain this to you guys. I'm going to show you what this means. Let's figure out what it means, guys. In verse 14, we're going to figure out what does this parable mean? Why is Jesus teaching this to the people right here? In verse 14, it says the farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no roots, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others like seed sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. What a powerful passage of scripture. What a powerful parable right here. And Jesus explains, says, hey, the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word. And what are the soils? They're different types of people. And in the account of gospel, uh, the, the gospel of Matthew, it says, hey, these are people's hearts. The different type of hearts is the different types of soils. Jesus is such a master preacher that everybody who is hearing in this crowd fit into one of these soils. And he's such a master preacher that it doesn't just hold to that crowd, but it holds to everybody in the world. Everybody in existence, everybody in the world is one of these four soils. Every one of us on this screen right here is one of these four soils. And the soils, again, they have to deal with man's heart. So this morning, I really want you to relate. I really want you to be real with yourself. Which soil of you, are you this morning? The title of the lesson is The Heart of Man. The Heart of Man. Come on. What soil are you this morning. Amen. We got four points this morning. Cause guess what? There's four types of soils guys. So we got to get a point for each one of those. You can't leave any out. Amen. So the first soil is the soil that's on the path. And in verse 15, it says some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Now, right here, the path is hard, and so this represents somebody's heart who is hard to the Word of God. Now, many things can harden somebody's heart. A lack of faith, a lack of belief can harden somebody's heart to where the Word of God cannot get in there and penetrate. Uh, a love of sin over God's Word can harden somebody's heart. Past hurts can harden somebody's heart. They just say, hey, God, I don't understand why you would bring me through this, and they harden their hearts in that way. But I believe that all these are true, and yet Jesus was even talking about one more thing that can harden somebody's heart as well. You understand, up to this point in Mark, Jesus was getting dicey with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. I mean, even in chapter 3, verse 6, the Pharisees were looking for a way to kill Jesus already. And he was just rebuking them, and they were going at it. And so I believe that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were in this crowd and they were hearing this lesson and this message, this parable from Jesus, and he was talking about the religious pride of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And he was going after him saying, man, you guys, you're just, your heart is so hard. Who are the Pharisees? The religious prideful, the religiously prideful. Lay it out, John. Why, how did they get there? 
why were their hearts hard if these were supposed to be the most religious people in the whole world right here? Well, in Matthew 15, verse 1 through 9, we just reference that. Go back and look at it on your own. The Pharisees and the teacher of law, they were holding to tradition above the word of God. And so Jesus gives them a nice little rebuke see right there. And he says, you guys are hypocrites. And in fact, your hearts are far from me. Your hearts are not even close to me. It's far from me because you're putting the tradition over truth. And that's in fact, our first point, tradition or truth. This morning, are you worshiping by tradition? Are you worshiping by the truth, by the word of God? And it's incredible and convicting because only a few Pharisees ever made it to become disciples. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and I believe that's the only two that ever recorded in, in, in becoming disciples right there. And not many did because their religious pride. They were putting the traditions over truth. And now you got to think like, why were they doing this? How did this happen? Well, if you put your, yourself in the shoes of the Pharisees and in the context, this is how they grew up. The Pharisees, the teacher, oh, they grew up surrounded by tradition. They grew up believing that this was right. So every day, week, and year, they were doing these things based on the Old Testament, believing that it was the truth. And then when Jesus came, he said, hey, in fact, you're not doing what's right. This is the truth. Their hearts were hard because of their traditions. Their hearts were hardened because of their past experiences and how they were raised. And guys, I'm afraid it could be the same for us today. We live in a world that is seeped with traditions. Now, don't get me wrong. I love some traditions. Oh, my gosh, guys, Thanksgiving's coming up in about, you know, two months right here. Oh, my gosh. Gosh, you ain't never had a Thanksgiving unless you've gone to the South and had some Thanksgiving. Amen, guys? Let me tell you something. Thanksgiving, I'm going to thoroughly enjoy that holiday right there, that tradition. Christmas is coming up. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to thoroughly enjoy that tradition right there. But as many good traditions that there are, there are far more bad traditions. And the problem is when these traditions go down and they make themselves go into the church, what does this look like? Well, today, there are over 450 different denominations of Christianity, and yet there's one Bible. There's one Bible. How does that happen? People put traditions over the Word of God. And you can go in any street corner, find different denominations, different churches who are going to preach a gospel that you want to hear that's more comfortable for you, more convenient for you, and you can hear whatever you want because of tradition. And yet this morning, guys, we are not worshiping based off of tradition, but we're saying, hey, this is the truth right here. The word of God is a truth, and we've got to worship based off of the word of God. We have to put truth over tradition. And I, I believe that one reason it was so tough for the Pharisees is that they were sentimental with tradition. They let sentimentality get in the way. Because you can understand, if Jesus came to them and what he was saying was the truth, this just didn't affect them, but it affected everyone they ever knew. Not only was it them that was wrong anymore, but now what about all their Pharisee friends? What about their families? What about the teachers of law? What about all those people? So there was a, a great sentimentality when Jesus said, hey, you, in fact, you're not obeying correctly. There was a pain because of what the implications meant as Jesus was preaching and teaching to them. Everybody they ever known was worshiping tradition over truth. You know, there are a couple quotes that I want to tell us. Winston Churchill once said, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing ever happens. James Garfield once said, who was actually a disciple and was a president back in the 1800s. He said, the truth will make you miserable before it sets you free. The truth will make you miserable oh, come on. before it sets you free. And this morning, you have to decide, are you going to worship tradition or are you going to worship truth? I don't want any of our hearts to be hardened by the tradition. I can totally relate. You know, I just want to be open about my own life. You know, I grew up going to church. My mom had us in church every Sunday, man, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed those times. We would go to our pastor's house. We'd play all kinds of games and sports and everything, and I loved it. It was so fun. And then I grew up and the Bible was a common thing in our house. All these, you know, we, we, we knew it and we were raised in this way. But then I came out to California 
and I started to study the Bible. And I'll never forget, you know, studying the Bible and you start realizing like, oh my gosh, man, I, I've never been taught this stuff. You know, like I know, you know, the big stories and I know, hey, it's good to follow God and be a Christian, but man, you're telling me I got to surrender everything. You tell me I got to become a disciple. I got to lose everything. Oh my gosh. And I'll never forget. I was so convicted. I was so cut. And there was a great pain in my heart because as I was studying, not only did I realize what this meant for me, but I realized what this meant for all my old friends, for all my old church family, because if I had never been taught what it was, what it means to be a real Christian, what does that mean about the church I was going to? What did that mean about, about my friends who claimed to be Christian as well? And there was a great pain, a great sentimentality because of the truth and what that meant. And I wrestled, I wrestled so hard. I cried and I wrestled with the scriptures, but I finally surrendered. I finally surrendered to God. And I was like, you know what? Thank God this happened because I'd rather find this out now than when it's too late. And I, I became a true Christian and I got baptized June 5th, 2015 as a sold out disciple for the forgiveness of my sins. And it's been the best decision that I've ever made in my life. Guys, the last five years have been so incredible. Oh my gosh. I've got the best friends a guy could ever ask for, a family in the kingdom. I'm married to an amazing woman of God. We've got a little nugget on the way, a little baby right there. Oh my gosh. Like there's so much good. And it, I would have never gotten to this point if I would have not gone through the pain at first. If I would have not gone through the pain of the sentimentality and wrestling through the scriptures. And now to see the joy and the gratitude that I have for God and the kingdom. You know, I want to challenge all of us. Let the Bible be the standard of your life. Let the Bible be the standard of your life, even regardless of what the implications mean. Regardless of the implications, let the Bible be the center of your life. And I want to challenge you, study the Bible with the person who brought you out today. Study the Bible with the person who brought you out. None of us wants to get carried off by Satan, but we will if we allow our hearts to be hardened by traditions. Amen? Point number one. Now we're going on, and there's three more, more soils. And you might think, well, well, man, like only the last one is the one who produces things. That's the only one who's a Christian. Actually, the next three all take root. And so all these next three soils are people who become Christians, but have different outcomes. Go to verse 16 in, in uh, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, four verse 16, our second point. And it says, others like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word, and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. This is somebody who hears the word, they hear the message, and they're so fired up. They, and they, man, they take it on at once. They're like, I've got to do this. I've got to be a Christian. This is what I want to do. And they become one. But it says that they only last a short time because they have no root. Why? Because the soil is mixed with rock and sediment, and their roots can't really go down. Our second point is rocky or rooted. Are you rocky or are you rooted this morning? You know, why is this important? Because the Bible guarantees that as Christians, we will face both hardship and persecution. So unless somebody is really rooted in God, then it's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when they will fall away. Because each one of us are going to face hardships, each one of us are going to face persecutions, and unless we're deeply rooted, we will not be able to handle these things. What does it look like to be shallow root and what does it look like to be deeply rooted go to jeremiah chapter 17 we're going to take a look at this real fast come on, come on Joey. Jeremiah chapter 17 what does it look like what's the comparison jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5 <clears throat> in verse 5 it says this is what the lord says cursed is the one who trusts in man Man, that just stings already right off top right there. Who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. That sounds painful and terrible. But 
Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Wow. How do we know which one we are? Well, which one do you relate to in the scripture? Are you the bush that's in a wasteland? Are you feeling parched spiritually? Are you feeling dehydrated? Are you barely hanging on to life? Are you going through challenges and it's just, just no way to get through it? Are you, are you dehydrated spiritually? Or are you like this tree that's planted by the, the, the stream that its roots are by the water? And man, it says it doesn't matter what it goes through. It goes through heat, persecution. It goes through drought, hardship. And yet it leaves are always green. Why? Because its roots are in the stream. Its roots are in the word of God that gives life. Which one of these do you relate with? The difference is in the roots. You know, I grew up in the South and, uh, you know, that's why I was talking about Thanksgiving right there. You know, I grew up in the South. But one thing in the South that we have to deal with if you're on the Gulf Coast is hurricanes. And guys, it's actually hurricane season right now. And I called my mom and my sister and this last week they had a hurricane go through my hometown. And guess what? This was only a category two. It was one mile an hour away from being a category three. You got to understand, my hometown was in the eye of the storm at one point. What that means is that it got the worst of the brunt going forward and the backlash. I mean, this thing just wrecked. And it's, it was called Hurricane Sally. Hurricane Sally. And man, Hurricane Sally came through, guys. And my mom showed me some pictures and my grandparents as well. My back, my, in, in my old house back home, my back door, there's 35 free, feet from my back door was this building called Swatters. And I used to go there all the time. It was an indoor soccer place and they had batting cages, all this stuff. During the hurricane, hurricane a tornado came and it literally ripped half of Swatters away. Half of Swatters is gone. That's 35 feet from my back door. My mom's house wasn't touched. Praise God. My, my, my uh, sister showed me pictures of my grandparents' house. Awesome backyard. Two grown trees fell all the way down, got uprooted, and fell into my grandparents' backyard. Almost on the roof right there. And you see the destruction, the wake of what happened. And yet what blows my mind, though, is that you see all this destruction and yet you've got these trees that are full grown that are blown over. And yet right next to them are other trees that stay upright. And it's like, how in the world did this huge oak tree get blown over? But this little tree right here is standing up. Nothing ever happened. I mean, it's missing some leaves, but it's good. Well, I looked it up and it was interesting. I researched it and there's a note on the roots of a tree. Check this out. This is a researcher talking about roots and how important they are for a tree. It says, one of the most important considerations with all the survivor types of trees is how well the specimen is rooted to the ground. If you prepared proper planting holes, your tree or plant is much less likely to be tipped over or toppled altogether. Shallow rooting, get this, due to rock or hard subsoil obstru obstruction is practically a guarantee that the tree or large plant will be toppled in severe weather. Is that incredible or what? That it's a guarantee. If there's a rocky soil with the tree, it is a guarantee that if severe weather comes that way, it's going to be toppled over. So how are these trees blown over? The other one stood up. The difference was in the roots. You know, for all of us, guys, we will all face hardship, persecutions. We will all face these things. We will all go through the storm of life. And yet if you are rooted, if we are deeply rooted in the word of God, we can face any storm that life brings us. But if we have shallow roots, even a strong wind will blow us over. Even a barely strong wind will blow wow. us over. And for us, we have got to be deeply rooted. How are your times with God? How is your time with the Lord? What does it mean to be rooted in God? You're relying on God. You're spending time with the Lord. The quiet time that you have every day is the most important time of your day every single day that there's an excitement, an encouragement, a, de a dependence on God, that we don't rely on us, but we rely on the Lord and nothing else. You know, I want to challenge all of us. Get deeply rooted with God. Get deep with the Lord. 
Don't miss a quiet time for this year. And don't just have a check, it, check the box quiet time. Get deep with God. Find some nuggets. I want to challenge you. Don't miss a time with God for the rest of the year. Don't be rocky. Be rooted in the Lord. Moving on to our third point right now. And the third soil is in verse 18 of Mark chapter 4. In verse 18, it says, Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Now, this is the, the thorny soil right here. And it says that this seed grows up, but it gets choked out because there's thorns around it. And what are the thorns? The deceitfulness of wealth, desires for other things. This soil is choked out by life's worries. Our third point is checked in or choked out. Are you checked in this morning? Or are you choked out spiritually? Are you checked in or choked out? This is a Christian who is distracted. This is a disciple who is distracted. Somebody who has started to put the priorities of their job, their career, education, finances, all these different things, family, relationships, above the purpose that God gives us. Somebody who is checked out of their purpose. Now, guys, don't get me wrong. Guess what? We've got to be excellent in these things. We need to get the best grades. We need to be doing well financially, get out of debt, all these things. But we cannot allow these to become the priority over what God has prioritized for us, which is his will, making disciples. And how do you know you're here? You are totally checked out. No Bible studies, not sharing faith. And guess what? When you're at this place, there's a lot of worry in your life as well. Like, man, I just can't seek first the kingdom because I got to do my school. I got to do my job, all this stuff. And there's so many things that just checks out and chokes you out spiritually. Come on, Joey. You know, Matthew 6, 25 through 33, it says, do not worry. Do not worry about these things. But if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, God is going to totally take care of you. You know, it's interesting. The word worry in the Greek is the same that it means to be choked out. So it says, do not be choked out. Do not be worried or you will be choked out. Instead, prioritize. You got to ask yourself, are you checked in? Are you choked out this morning? You know, I can totally relate. Uh, me and Karen, we've been married for about a year and a half now. And I'll never forget getting ready for a wedding. I mean, Dakota and Karen, they just went through this. Let me tell you guys something. I didn't know there was so much to do. I didn't know you had to do so much to get ready for when I was like, oh my gosh, I get this huge list. I got to get the songs. I got to get the color. I'm like, what do you mean? I got to pick between gold and, and uh, what was the other color? Oh, I can't even remember, but like an off gold. I was like, well, I don't care about that. I'm like, well, what are we talking about? I want to get married. champagne, you know? champagne, champagne, gold. I was like, what? I don't care about gold and champagne. I want to get married. You know, and there's all these different things. I'm like, oh my gosh, the appetizers, the, the dessert, all this different stuff. And I, I remember I was waking up every day so worried, so worried. I was like, oh, oh, 60 days ago. Okay, do I got all the invites? Do I got all this? Da, 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 da. Okay, 45 days ago, do I got everything ready? And it just was choking me out. I was choked out. And I remember I had a great D time. Got a nice little rebuke right there. But I realized that I had prioritized the wedding above my purpose. Now, the wedding's super important, but it doesn't over-prioritize God's purpose for my life. And remember, I, I, took the, I took the discipling. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to worry about this. I know God's going to take care of it. I'm going to focus on God's business, and he's going to focus on my business. And I still set times for the wedding to be done, but I was back sharing my faith. And after that, I believe a week after that, we baptized a guy at the Ohio State University. I was like, oh, my gosh. But better than anything, I wasn't waking up worried. I was waking up secure, totally at peace, not worried because I knew that God was going to take care of it. And guess what, guys? We had one of the best weddings you could ever ask for. But you got to ask yourself, are you checked in? Are you choked out this morning? You got to ask yourself, is there anything that has become a bigger priority in your life than God, his word, and his purpose for your life? Check your priorities. Is there any? Thing that's a higher priority in your life, even though you think it might be a good priority. Is there anything that has superseded God's priority for your life? I want to challenge all of us, get refocused and reprioritize guys. So now we got one more soil left and you might be asking yourself, well, bro, I'm having great times. I'm totally focused on, I'm prioritizing, right? 
what's going on? What's this last soul you're talking about? Well, let's go there in verse 20 of Mark chapter 4. It says, others like seed sown on good soil, they hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 36 or even 100 times what was sown. And right here, this is somebody who hears it, retains it, and they're bearing fruit. This is a Christian, a disciple that is fruitful. But there's one more ingredient in this list right here. Go to the parallel count in Luke chapter 8 real fast. Luke chapter 8. What's the last ingredient? to bear fruit. Luke chapter 8 verse 15, parallel account of the sower right here, and it says, but the seed on good soil stands for those with the noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Perseverance. Our last point this morning is simply persevere and produce. Persevere and produce. So you got to say, man, if you're soft-hearted, if you're deeply rooted, if you're not distracted, but you haven't produced fruit still, what's the solution? You just got to hold on a little bit. You just got to persevere. You just got to keep on fighting. You just can't give up. And we've got to persevere so that we can produce. In Hebrews chapter 12, one of my favorite passages, Hebrews chapter 12, and in verse 7, I think this is a scripture that all of us can take on. It says, endure hardship as discipline. Amen? That's challenging already. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us as, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Persevere and produce. This is, man, you've got to endure hardship. All of us will go through challenges and pains and toils. All of us will go through these trials and yet we've got to persevere. We've got to hold on, endure this as discipline. And what's the end result? We will produce a harvest of righteousness. You know, I grew up playing a lot of video games. Amen, brothers. And uh, specifically computer ones. And I know Brandon and Solomon know exactly what I'm talking about. Amen. And uh, played computer games. They're like, amen, brother. And, you know, I wasn't really into, like, the big gaming. I was just, you ever play those, like, BMX ones where you got to, like, make sure the guy doesn't fall over or, you know, like, maybe you guys know what I'm talking about. Maybe not. But I would play that in middle school. And I remember there was ads on the side of the screen. And I never forget there was this specific app. And it was of these two guys, one on top, one on bottom. And they were both mining for diamonds. And they're going after it. This guy on the top, he's, like, working. He's sweating. He's, he's pickaxing it. And he's like six feet away from this big thing of diamonds, but he's going after it. But then the guy on the bottom, he's got his pickaxe over his shoulder. He's turned around and he's heading back out and he's totally given up and he's totally left. And yet the shocking thing is that if he would have swung his pickaxe just one more time, he would have hit the diamonds. He would have hit the diamonds. He gave up right in time. He was one swing away from getting these diamonds. And I think we can relate. Many of us, we're just swinging our pickaxe and we're working and we're going through it, working hard. And yet there may be six more feet that we have to go through until we get this harvest of righteousness right here, until we get those diamonds. And in others, of, others of us, we can relate. Maybe we got our pickaxe on our back right now. Maybe we started to turn around and just give up spiritually and stop putting our hands to the work of the Lord. But you got to realize you're just one swing away. You're just one person away from getting somebody who's, who's open. You're just one person away from somebody who's going to become a disciple. You're just one person away. You're one swing away. But we've got to persevere and produce. And that's my challenge. Share your faith just one more time this week. Get into just one more Bible study this week. And after you do that, just do one more time as well. Because we've got to persevere and produce. You know, in closing this morning, 
we have to ask ourselves, which soil are you? Which soil are you? And really take a sobering look right there. Are you hardened by tradition? Are you hardened by tradition, by religiosity? Are you soft to let the word of God really take root in your heart? Are you deeply rooted in God or have you had a rocky week? Are you deeply rooted in the Lord or have you had a rocky week right there? Are you checked into God's plan for your life or are you choked out by life's words? Or are you persevering and waiting to bear some fruit soon? For us, all of us in here, let's strive to be the good soil. Let's strive to be the soft heart so that God can allow us to produce much fruit. We don't get ripped away. We don't get blown away, but we stay faithful to the end. I love you guys, and to God be all the glory. Come on, Joey. <laughs>